I've got a question for everybody today. What's your prayer life been like in the last five or six days? Have you prayed every single day? And how much prayer did you invest in with your relationship with God? Or if you're honest, have you at times found it either hard to pray, or if you're honest, not motivated to really want to pray or feel like praying? You just don't feel like it. You're not against it. You just don't feel like it. And so it hasn't happened. Have you missed days of prayer? Very, very dangerous. And uh, that's what we're talking about today. When you find it hard to pray, what can we do? I recently posted on my Facebook, in fact, that very question about prayer. Uh, when you find it hard to pray, what do you do? I posted it and I asked, do you ever find it hard to pray? Why does it happen sooner or later? And what do you do in those times? The feedback I thought was really interesting. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read them, but I'll talk about some of it. Quite a few admitted that they have those times of finding it, finding themselves not motivated to do so. Yeah, wow. In the times we now live, 2020 was an awful year. There were over 100 catastrophes worldwide that were very significant in nature. A lot of fires around the world, uh, locusts, hurricanes, tornadoes, um, earthquakes, many, many, many disasters. And then the COVID-19 plague and the race riots and the Black Lives Matter stuff and all that. Anyway, it, it, it's 2020. Now, the year 20 turns 21 uh, in, in a few weeks. I'm, 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 I'm recording this the last week or so of December, and it'll be allowed to drink, someone said, so it might not necessarily get any better. So that was supposed to be a joke, but, but hey, it's been tough. Uh, I, it doesn't look like 2021 will necessarily be any better. So welcome to Light on the Rock, everybody, dear friends around the world. Many of you are coming from many, many different countries all over the world, about 70 countries. I'm Philip Shields. I'm host and founder of this website. And my focus always is to help build, in all of my talks, the, the real goal is to help build that loving, obedient, uh, close, worshipful walk with our Father in heaven, to love Him with all of our hearts, and Yeshua, our Savior, same thing. And also a warmer, closer relationship with each other, with people. No matter their color, their race, their ethnic group, their tribe, their political affiliation. Sometimes it's hard to love someone of the opposite political affiliation, but we have to love everybody. Our, our real citizenship, we have a citizenship here on earth. I've talked about that. I've written blogs on it. But our main citizenship is in heaven. Uh, you know, our kingdom is in heaven. And so that's where our heart needs to be. But anyway, I have to keep reminding myself of all of this, to love everybody. There are the, these are the two greatest commandments. And please also read the blogs I have on the website. Feel free to give me a five-star, four-star if you feel up to it, or however you feel this blog has, or that blog has benefited you. This is a sermon. Uh, if you'd like to leave a comment on the sermon, you'll need, on the sermons, you'll need to register uh, to make, leave comments. But I think you are allowed now. We put in a five-star choice, one-star, two-star, all the way to five, without having to register. So that's up to you. Anyway, check out the video sermons, too, as well as the audio ones. Now, back to my Facebook question and some of the answers I received. Um, the common themes that came in the thread included, it, it was hard to pray when they felt they had sinned and disappointed God. Okay, sinned and disappointed God. Perhaps many of us can relate to that. Or thinking, maybe this is related to the last one, that God was angry with them. And what right did they have to come before his holy, perfect presence? Holy God. They just didn't feel like, they didn't feel good about coming before God. And I, I think uh, we'll, talk, we'll address that later in the sermon. Some admitted they can do a ton of Bible study, even all day, even several days in a row. But when it comes to praying, there does and there can be a, a block to that. Some admitted that other things just seem to get in the way and just never gets done. They get busy. Some will admit that, that at times they wonder why bother? Because honestly, they aren't seeing their prayers answered anyway. So why bother? And, you know, they, they prayed, but their very ill son or daughter died anyway. Their husband or their wife lost his job. Lost, the husband lost his job anyway. Uh, the pain that racks their body got worse. So why bother? 
You see what I'm saying? Some some said that, and I can I can understand that. Uh, but be aware that that's what's happening. Several mentioned they're not sure what to say, or if they're saying it right, or they're saying something wrong. Uh, they have a maybe a don't realize it's it's a father child conversation. There is no right or wrong way to approach your father. Some people make rules that you have to be fully dressed, maybe even put a coat and tie. <laughs> I don't know. Or that you take your shoes off or put your shoes on. Uh, hey, you know, we're children of God Almighty, and don't complicate it. Don't complicate that. Yes, when I do my formal praying, I do envision God sitting on his throne with the four living creatures, the 24 elders. I try to have that actual picture in my mind and have a reverence, a, a, a point of reverence. So anyway, before I address the points entirely, I have to ask you, can there be anything can there be anything more important to us than staying in prayer contact frequently with our Abba, our Daddy, our Father, and our Savior? Is there anything that's more important? I think it's more important than breathing. <laughs> okay, so I'm making my point. Yeshua and Paul and others admonish us, in fact, to pray always. Never give up. Luke 18, we'll read it in a minute. Jesus said that men ought always to pray and not give up. Don't be faint. Let's read a few scriptures Yeshua and the prophets and apostles all said why it's a must. But again, remember the theme and the focus of today's discussion is not on prayer itself so much but the, or the mechanics of it, but being motivated to want to pray, to get it done, to look forward to it. Um, and so what makes people motivated to pray and others not motivated? What's missing? That's, that's my real theme. But anyway, after speaking at the very, about the very end times in Luke 17 at the end of it, how dangerous the world will be. He then from there, remember there were no chapter breaks, goes into Luke 18, verse 1 and 2, and he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. And he gives the parable about the persistent widow. And then later in Luke 21, again, after discussing many of the terrifying times in the very end times, he comes to Luke 21 verse 36 and he says watch my notes say 35 I'm pretty sure it should be 36 he said watch and pray always why that you may be accounted worthy to escape these things watch and pray always so that God accounts you as worthy to not have to go through all the things he had just talked about in the verses before Luke 21, 36. So my point is our very lives and our end time protection from the great tribulation and day of wrath depend on us having a very close, consistent, powerful praying relationship with our God and the effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Yes, you see, prayer is a relationship. It's conversation with the Almighty so learn to stop once in a while while you're praying, in case I forget to bring it up later. Once in a while, especially on your formal praying, where you're down by your bed or your face on the carpet or whatever, a lot of prayers in the past where people had their heads right on the ground, face to the ground, on the ground even. So when those times come, understand that you are building a relationship that can last a long, long time and save you from a lot of trouble coming up. So imagine your own, imagine having, here's another thing that might help you, just value this, please value this. Imagine having your own hotline, your own telephone, to the most important, most loving, most powerful being in the entire universe, and that's God Most High. That's Abba. Now, you've been given this phone, to, uh, an access to this person, and to Christ, and your phone has unlimited time, you're told. You can use it from anywhere in the world at any time of your choosing, 24-7, any time of the day or night. Imagine that, that you have access. I've often wondered, you know, why did Adam and Eve take so long? Why didn't they just go to the tree of life, go ahead and eat it from day one? Once they, it was explained to them there's a tree of life, why didn't they just grab one, whatever it was, one, one fruit, something, it was almond, something, <laughs> not almonds, but... Uh, Think of something else. 
But anyway, not apples, but but why didn't they just go ahead and eat it? But they didn't. They had access to it. They, ne they never bothered. We have access to the greatest being in the universe. And we let days go by sometimes, like some people do, without praying at all. And I don't mean prayers around the rosary wheel or chain, beads, rosary beads. I don't mean... Manuf I, I don't mean re repetitive prayers. I mean you talking to your father. So we're now, so imagine that having unlimited time. And I wonder how many of you young people would try to text God instead. But imagine what we have and we're being told to use it in connection daily. Don't give up. It's your direct line to the heavenly mercy seat. Make it a two-way conversation. Stop and listen once in a while. Stop and say, Father, do you have something you want to say to me? And probably the first few times you do that, nothing will happen. But the, the time will come that, and I have, a, I have a journal with me as I pray, and the time will come, and many times, frankly, uh, there is nothing for me. But the time will come when you'll start having some thoughts that you know you didn't generate, and they're from God. He's talking to you. He hasn't learned to, he hasn't stopped talking to us. He hasn't uh, forgotten how to communicate with us. He still talks to us, but we have to be tuned in. We have to be listening. And we have to give him a chance to speak without us just nonstop talking. Anyway, so it sounds to me like Luke 21, 36 says that those who do not have that close-knit relationship will, and, and prayer will not be able to escape the things that are about to happen. Why? Because God's all about relationship. Loving Him and loving one another. And if you find it hard to pray, think of this concept as well. I'm going to kind of just jump around a little bit in this sermon more than usual, but when you had fallen in love, when you fell in love with your future wife, your future husband, weren't you motivated to talk to her or him every chance you got? You made time. You made time. And you found time because you loved her so much. You loved him so much. Prayer really should be the same. If we form the right relationship and are deeply in love with our Savior and love our Father, we will pray because we want to throughout the day keep in touch. We enjoy it. It's fun. It's loving. A lack of motivation might be a signal from God to you that something's amiss in the relationship. We'll talk more about that later. That the, if you have a deep love for God and for Yeshua, nothing's going to be able to take you away from Him. Nothing. What, what shall, Romans 8, the end of it, it says, what, what can separate us from the love of God, the love of Christ? Nothing. Nothing. And that's hopefully true for all of us. It's not in my notes, but I think God just told me to tell you that in the end of Romans 8. Nothing can separate you. And if you have that love for Him and for Christ, you will absolutely make time, find time. Now, also, so because hard times and painful times tend to make us pray more, uh, God allows those who aren't praying much now to go through the hard times for their good. God knows it's in our best interest to have to rely on Him, to pray more. And in hard times, we will pray more. But we Americans are so into DIY, do-it-yourself kind of mentality, we don't like to ask people for help. We don't like to ask God for help. We don't want to rely on God. I think that's part of it for many of you. So in people like that, God has to say, okay, you do it yourself then. And in times of pain and trouble and illness and accidents and different things, we then start to pray more. Think of the example of Israel all through the book of Judges. They, they went through cycles of oppression. Then they prayed and God heard. And then, uh, and then they got away from God and they got through oppression again. Then they prayed and then God heard over and over. That's the cycle in the book of Judges. Think also of the example of David. Nathan the prophet had come in and said, you're that man who committed that adultery. Took this, uh, took this man's only lamb that he had, his, you know, Bathsheba. And uh, in fact, he killed Uriah. David did. And so they had a child, a, a baby born from this adultery, and the child, not a baby anymore, and the Hebrew there is not a baby, but a, uh, the child, maybe three or four or five years old, was sick. God said the baby was going to die. 
as a punishment for David. The child was sick for seven days before he died. Why? Because every time, every day the child was still alive, David was fasting for God to heal him, to change his mind. Why did God let the child die for seven, I mean, uh, get sick for seven days? That was for David's sake. No doubt he had been languishing in his prayer life, acting like nothing was wrong all those years as the baby grew into a toddler, into a young child. So anyway, it was for David's reasons why God made the child sick for seven days so that David would keep fasting and praying. God's basically saying, David, you need me. You need that relationship with me, and you've gotten away from that lately. So anyway, so I don't want to go through the Great Tribulation. I want God's protection and blessing. So watch and pray always that you be counted worthy to escape these things. So if you want less pain and hardship, probably, no, even people who are totally righteous have an awful lot of suffering and pain, as Apostle Paul certainly did. But I'm just saying that uh, God many times will use pain and suffering to wake us up. Now, God also is trying to prepare a people prepared for the Lord. That's the mission given to John the Baptist in John 1, 17. And Yeshua said in another place that there's yet a coming Elijah, one of the two witnesses perhaps, who will prepare a people for the Lord. That means a lot of prayer. You're supposed to be a house of prayer. You're the temple of God's Spirit. You're His house. And if it were a crime to be a fervently praying person, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would people who know you call you a living house of prayer? That's what it's supposed to be like, folks. That's the goal. Another point, Yeshua made it really clear how important prayer is. He said, he said that without the Father's presence inside him as Son of God, Yeshua said he could do nothing. The Son of God said he could do nothing apart from God. So that's why he prayed a lot, including all night. In Luke 6, verses 12 to 16, he prayed all night and then decided on who the 12, he wanted God to guide who, who should the 12 apostles be out of the 70 or more that he had as disciples. In John 5, 19, most assuredly he says to them, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Nothing. I'll put the whole verse in the notes. In John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, Yeshua speaking, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, without God in us, without that contact and and cohesion with Yeshua and God the Father, without me you can do nothing. John 15, verse 5. So as we abide in Yeshua, in prayer, John 15, 8 says we start to bear the fruit that proves we're a disciple. So of course, we've got to learn to pray. Prayer reminds us of our place. We're down there on our knees. We're bowing our head. So I see prayer as basically two types. The formal prayers, where you are on your knees in, in a private room, not as the Jews do, where they try to do it out publicly or whatever. Yeshua said, go to, go to your closet, go to a private room, do it in a place that's private where you can shut the door. Uh, that's formal prayer. And, and we find that David and Daniel uh, did it three times a day. Uh, Psalm 55, 17, morning, evening, and at noon shall I pray, is what David said. And then we find in Daniel 6, verse 10, I'll put all these scriptures in the notes, that the king was talked into having a, a ruling, a law, that for 30 days no one could pray to anybody except him. That kind of massaged his ego, he went along with it. They immediately went to go uh, spy on Daniel. They knew what he did, that he prayed three times a day. So Daniel 6, verse 10 says, When Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day. He knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks 
before his God, as was his custom since he was a young man, since, since early days. Notice he kneels down, notice it's three times, and notice that he prayed and gave thanks in a very, very di difficult ruling. The king had said, whoever breaks this is going to be thrown alive into the lion's den. And yet he still gave thanks even for that trial. I have a sermon on giving thanks in all things and for all things, just giving thanks. Just look up the word thanks or being thankful and see what comes up. You'll find it. I gave it in um, earlier in 2020, I think. It might have been 2019. Anyway, besides these formal prayer times, we also have spontaneous prayer. So I try to pray three times a day. Usually I manage two, uh, sometimes three on my knees, sometimes five or six on my knees lately. You think of someone needing help and healing, you pray right then and there, wherever you are. If you're driving or doing dishes, or if you're even at work, just write that in there and just say a prayer. And by the way, instead of saying prayers, like I just said, let's pray. Let's pray. Let it be from your heart. Don't say your prayers. Pray. It's a big difference. You have your prayer as you begin your Bible study. Or maybe you hear an ambulance going by, the sirens wailing. Pray for them. Or maybe you're going through a temptation. And you know the way this is going, I'm going to sin. I'm going to sin. No, you pray and you nip it in the bud and you pray for strength and you ask God to take away the wrong thoughts and get away from the temptation. Flee fornication, things like that. Flee any temptation. So you also include numerous prayers of gratitude, just spontaneously even. Everything you see around you. You see a beautiful deer or a butterfly or a beautiful mountain peak. Thank God for his brilliance and his just his love to let you see that. Thank God that you have eyes to see. Some people don't have eyes. They're blind. Thank God many times for the high calling and the Holy Spirit and Yeshua, the gift of his son and all of that spontaneously. And on days that I don't do all that, on the days I get too busy, disaster and sins can be laying in wait, lying in wait. Satan knows I'll be weak on those days. I'm not praying at all or even as much as I should be. And he strikes and he'll strike at you. So prayer has to become the first thing we do every day. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. That should be a memory verse. That should be one that maybe you write on, on three by five cards and scatter around the heart house Seek you first the kingdom of God. God won't just automatically slide into first base or automatically end up there. No, we have to seek him. We have to make it our goal. And we have to put him as the first priority of our life. I get up, go to the bathroom, let the dog out, then I get back on my knees. Sometimes I make the dog wait too. So, But um, anyway... You know what I'm saying. So it's the first thing you do before your world starts revolving, rotating or whatever in that particular day. Okay, so there's a lot more I want to say about prayer. But right now, be reminded that prayer is the most important thing you can do every day. If you're skipping days or barely doing it or it's half-hearted, lukewarm, Laodicean, not fervent, your heart's not in it. You're bored. Please. In fact, try to hear the sermon I gave called the Hindered Prayer. Hindered Prayer. Just type that in the search bar. That'll talk more about this as well from a different angle. So let's get back to this topic. How about when people find it hard to pray? One person said, especially when, he's known, when he knows he's done wrong, he has sinned. Uh, those are times he really finds it hard to pray. So... Let me address that first. When you're not sure what to say or you're worrying, uh, that's another thing too. People say, I don't even know what to say. Or, I don't feel right about what I'm trying to say. Or worry that you may not be having the, say, the, the right things. Or perhaps you've sinned real badly recently or had a big fight with your wife or your husband or you feel unworthy of coming before your Holy Father. The mood's not there. You're certainly not in the mood for prayer if you're hurting psychologically. If your boss is just, if you have a big fight with your boss or something, nothing's going right. But folks, that's exactly when 
we need to focus on praying. I have to remind myself of that too. When I am upset and so upset I don't even want to pray, that's exactly when I need to pray. Remember, Peter tells us to take care of our marital relationships. He says, honor, give honor to the weaker vessel, your wife, so your prayers are not hindered. First Peter 3, 7, that's what I mean. I have a sermon called Hindered Prayer. So our prayers can be hindered. Any opportunity that Satan and his demons can to hinder our prayers from getting answered, he, they'll, they'll do it. So let's go back to Romans 8. I want to point out a couple things here. Romans 8, verses 14 and 15 say that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And if we're not led by the Spirit, but led by the flesh, I think the previous verse says we're going to die. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So we've got to be at that point where we are being led by God's Spirit, first of all, and that comes partly from seeking God a lot in prayer and asking Him to motivate, activate the Holy Spirit in us, to help us even pray in the Spirit, walk in, in the Spirit, live in the Spirit. Prayer is about living in the Spirit instead of in the flesh. Too many of us, me too, it's about living in the Spirit, not in the flesh. I often live too much in the flesh and the carnal as well. So write that down as a thought. Are you living in the Spirit? Spiritual things. Colossians 3 and other places talk about that a lot. If you're led by the Spirit of God, you're a son of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, Romans 8.15. Romans 8.15, again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption. So we can call out Abba, Daddy, okay? So when we pray, Abba means Daddy. We're praying to our Daddy. Romans 8, verse 16 now, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. We have a spirit in man that we are children of God. And 1 Corinthians 6, 17, I'll try to turn to it later, but if I have time, but it says in verse 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 16, that just as a man and a harlot become one flesh, and so you guys don't be doing that, Paul's saying to the saints in Corinth. Think about that. They were still called saints, even though many of them were doing things. He says that's going to end up being a lot of trouble. And he says you should not take a member of the body of Christ and make it a member of a harlot. And then he goes on in verse 17 saying, Know you not that if you're joined to Christ, you are one spirit with him. What happens is right here in Romans eight sixteen, the spirit bears witness with our spirit, they become one spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. Okay, that we are children of God, and if children, then we're heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him. So God is bequeathing the kingdom of God to Yeshua, to Christ, who himself also said to his apostles, I've been given a kingdom, and I'm giving you a kingdom. So we're co-heirs with Christ, because we're part of him. Verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. For we don't even know how we should pray sometimes, as we ought. But the Spirit makes intercession for us. God's Spirit intercedes for us. God's Spirit, I really believe, is God's presence in us. It's God the Father himself, his presence by his Spirit in us. It's more than a force. It's more than a force. It's more than a power. Because the Holy Spirit also speaks to different ones. Acts 13, the Holy Spirit told those who were praying and fasting to separate and consecrate Paul and Barnabas, for example. The Holy Spirit uh, would constrain Paul from going to different places at times. So it's more than just a power. Anyway, with groanings which cannot be uttered, so the Spirit speaks for us, and we're praying with groanings that can't be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So if you don't know how to pray or what to say, 
uh, how to say it, or if you're not quite in the mood for saying it right, or you're all confused, or all you're doing is sobbing because someone's just died or is dying. Maybe you're praying right beside them. That's fine. That's fine. With groanings which cannot be uttered, God's Spirit searches the heart and makes intercession for you. Okay, you got that? Um, in a heartfelt prayer, we're opening up our souls, our hearts, to someone greater than we are, a greater cause than we are. Some have a hard time with this. But pray especially in those times when you need to open up. If all you can do is weep or sob, then weep or sob. But do so with a bowed heart, a bowed head, Admit your weaknesses, your needs, your longings, and cry out to God, even if the words don't quite come out right. Don't worry about it. God hears those prayers, probably especially those prayers. So the good news is God understands we find it hard sometimes to express ourselves properly or perfectly, so he sends us the help we need, his very own nature, his Holy Spirit, to translate what we're feeling so it all makes sense to God. Our spirit in man is joined with God's spirit, like I said in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 16 and 17, to become one spirit. So prayer gets our attitudes back to where it should be. Remember a lot of the Psalms, or some of them anyway, start off rather negatively. Why have why do the wicked prosper? Why have you not heard my prayers? Why do my pains and wounds continue? And then he always will end those Psalms, those prayers of his, in thanksgiving and praise. So prayer gets us in the right attitude. So I, I like to even read a psalm or two before praying, and then I have my own prayer. Those are David's prayers, but they're inspired. They're God's words. And so I, I think of it as priming the pump, if you know what that means. Priming the pump. In the Philippines, where I, where I grew up, we had a pump well. And sometimes we had to pour a little water. Where the water comes out, we had to pour a little water in there just to get it going, priming it. And so that's what it means to prime the pump. And you can prime the pump by starting with the Lord's Prayer as, a, as your pattern, and then go off from there into your heart and what you need to say. Or you can prime the pump by reading some of the Psalms. Because those are prayers of David, inspired prayers of David, and Asaph and different other ones. Moses, I think, has one or two in there too. So, if you don't know what to say and you're you're, you're sobbing and all that, fine, that's terrific. Don't worry about it. The next thing is, what if you feel unworthy? You've, you've, you've really done a big boo-boo. <laughs> you've had a big sin. And it's hard to come before God when you, when you realize, boy, how on earth could I have done that? I hate myself for that. Maybe you've committed adultery or fornication or gotten drunk and made a fool of yourself. Or maybe you did something stupid and lost your job. So we, it's very easy for us to feel unworthy to even be called a child of God because of our sins, and sometimes they repeat. Just like Paul says, he wants to do what's right, but he still finds himself stumbling. That's in Romans 7, verses 14 to 20. I'm sure you know that. I've referred to it a lot. Paul himself admitted his fleshly nature still sinned too often. Our spirit, our heart, doesn't want to anymore, but we still do. So the flesh is weak, so we still sin from time to time, sometimes very serious, grievous sins. So it's easier, we wrongly reason, to give prayer a pass for a while, to get in a better mood. Wrong, wrong, wrong. That's especially when you need to pray. pray. So especially after super serious lapses, we're reluctant. But if we really understand what God is truly like, even when you've had a grievous sin, if, if you humble yourself and cry out to him in repentance and admit and confess what you did or said and ask for his strength to help you return to him in obedience and to change the direction, that's what repentance really is about, it's not just confessing the sin, but turning back to God from the sin. 
The repent has in the original Greek and Hebrew the, the meaning of turning back, returning to God. But we all still lapse back into our sins at times, even when you do it. So when you do it a second or a third time, you start thinking, oh my, how can I come before God? And But some self-righteous ones among you start saying someone has not even properly repented because they did it again. Well, which of you can say you've repented of gossip and have never gossiped again? Which of you can say if you have an alcohol problem that you never got drunk again or drank too much? Which of you who condemn someone for falling into a sex sin can say you never ever flirt or, or have mental lust, which is as bad as a real thing, Yeshua said, or look at porn or fornicate or adultery. We can easily all slip back into sin. How many of you, for example, don't keep the Sabbath exactly perfectly? You're doing business on the Sabbath or something. Quit this thing of calling someone uh, or, 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 or saying someone has not repented because I don't see the fruits of repentance because he's still, he's still doing the same things as before. Basically, our lives must change. We must change. If we're not changing at all, then yes, we haven't repented. But even as we change, Paul says we still do stumble. Look at the tongue, for example. James says in James 3 that if you never uh, flub up with your tongue, you're a perfect person. What about coveting? You mean some of you guys never covet? You repented of coveting? Now you never covet again? Or you're breaking the Sabbath? Or some of you have a trouble with starting to use the F word or profanity? And, and uh, if you do repent of that, but if that's a habit, it might pop back up again. But come back to God like the prodigal son did in Luke 15. Luke 15, verses 11 to 32. If you're not familiar with the story, please even now stop this for a second and grab your Bible and read the whole thing. Luke 15, 11 to 32. He was terrible. The, he demanded his inheritance early between him and his other brother. And he defamed the family by, by his wasteful extravagant waste, consorting with whores, according to his brother later on in the story, gambling, drunken orgies, but eventually at a very low point after having lost everything, he realized what a mess he was in, feeding swine, it says. And he says, you know, here I've got my father's servants at home having lots to eat, and I have nothing to eat. And I'm languishing here. I know what I'll do. I'll go back to my father, and I'll tell him I'm, I don't even deserve to be your Son, let me be like a hired servant. So that's in Luke 15, verses 17 to 19. Father, I have sinned against, verse 18, I have sinned against heaven and earth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's what I'll say. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, verse 20. Luke 15, verse 20. Luke 15, verse 20. He arose and came to his father. But even though he was still a long ways off, his father saw him coming and had compassion, ran and fell on his neck, you know, just uh, kissed him, hugged him. That's what that's saying. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth in your sight, and in heaven in your sight, I mean, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father interrupts, doesn't even let him finish the, the, the part about make me a, a, like a hired servant. He just says, the father said to the servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand. Sandals on his feet. Slaves and servants go around barefoot. But not my son. Obviously he'd come back barefooted. He'd lost everything. Probably had tattered clothing. Probably smelled awful having fed the pigs. Bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let's make, let's eat it and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. They began to be merry. I... When I feel I've done something so bad, I've had some of those days for sure in my life that I can't even approach God. I remind myself of this story. It's even a great song, When God Ran. When God Ran, you should check it out. Great, great song. But I read this story and I remember that God is looking for me to return. He saw me a long ways off. This is my story. This is your story. 
So when you feel unworthy to come before God, you've got to do a study on the mercy and the forgiveness of God as a loving Father to you. And if we never repent, never return to him, yes, he gets angry, he gets upset. But he really wants you to come back repentantly and restore the relationship with you. That's what he really wants. He wants to celebrate your repentance. The angels in heaven are happy, happier over a sinner who repents and 99 people who don't need repentance. That's also in Luke 15 probably around verse 7 or so. Remember Peter denying Christ three times? How would you feel if you were Peter? And now Christ is resurrected and wants to see you. Remember in Matthew 26, their eyes met after he denied his master and friend three times. How did Peter feel? Awful. He went off weeping, sobbing very upset. But did Jesus cast him off for that? He says, I don't know the man. It says he's practically cursing. Swearing. But no, in Mark 16 verses 5 to 7, Mary Magdalene saw an angel at the tomb of the resurrection and the angel told her to tell the other disciples and Peter, the angel says, that Yeshua was going ahead of them into Galilee. Now, how would you feel if you were Peter? Oh, man, I'm going to get bawled out now. I'm going to get yelled at now. That's not what happened. If you look at Luke 24, verse 36, the two men on the, on the road to Emmaus, after they realized they had been talking to Yeshua, they make the comment there in Luke 24, verse 36, that he's talked to Peter as well before the two men on the road to Emmaus. And before he appeared before the remaining 10 disciples, I say 10 because Thomas wasn't there in John 20. Uh, Thomas wasn't there initially. Um, so Thomas comes up in the second time. So anyway, my point was these two joined the other 10. They made 12 of them. So when we read 1 Corinthians 15 verse 5, he says he appeared to Peter. And then we know he appeared then to the two men of the road because uh, Apostle Paul then goes on to say, and then the 12, for there to be 12 that had to include the two men from Emmaus, which is the true story in Luke 24. But he'd already talked to Peter is my point that I'm getting at. By himself, before he appeared to all 12 of them, counting the two men from Emmaus, minus Thomas, in John 20. I think that's around verse 17 or so. I don't have the verse in front of me. John 21, I mean. John 21. John 21, verse 17. And therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. They're now, they're now fishing. Sometime later. John 21, verse 7. John 21, verse 7. Okay? Okay. Uh, They've seen him already in, in the room in, at the end of John 20. And now in John 21, they'd gone to Galilee. They're, they're back to fishing. And then they see a man making coals of fire on the shore. And he calls on them, how's your fishing going? And John recognized that it was the Lord. Now when Simon Peter, John 21, 7. Sorry, I got a little mixed up on some of the scriptures there. John 21, 7, Now when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he would removed it, and plunged into the sea. My point in telling this is to assure you God and Yeshua want you near them, want you forgiven, want you to understand you're still very much loved. My point here is, why would Peter jump into the sea if he felt he was going to get yelled at again? Why would Peter jump into the sea he jumped into the sea because he couldn't wait to be with his friend and master. Because he'd already seen him privately and then again with the group. And Yeshua was very convincing of his forgiveness of, of, of Peter, no doubt. Or else he would not have jumped into the sea to get to Christ that quickly. I want you to ponder that. So let the Holy Spirit pray with you and for you. Pray in the Spirit. 
Surely the day, there are days you find it hard to pray in your father, or even Yeshua. I want to talk about that even more today. So let's talk about some other reasons. I think a huge reason is you have not fallen in love with Yeshua, who's going to be the one you marry. You have not yet fallen in love deeply enough with Yeshua and our Father, for that matter. When you first fell in love and planned to marry, nothing could keep you apart. A lack of prayer life, and I preach to myself on this, is a sure indication that a huge component is missing from your life with God. And that is loving God with all your heart. Not one that you're making yourself do, not something that is part of a list or something, but you have fallen in love with Yeshua and with his father and your father. When you're in love with somebody and enjoy anybody, for that matter, as a good, deep friend, spending time together becomes fun, becomes enjoyable, wonderful time. Prayer is spending wonderful time together when we get it right. And prayer should always be a two-way conversation. Especially in the formal prayers when you've been praying for a while, stop. And then I say, Father in heaven, I would much rather you talk than me. What do you want to tell me? What do you want me to know? And then I open up my prayer journal and I wait. And frankly, some days there is nothing that comes. And some days I can't write fast enough. I've done that, especially in preparing sermons. I'll go and pray on my knees and just say, I, I, I've, reached, I, I've reached a roadblock in the sermon. I want your help on it. Can you help me? Where do I go from here? How do you want me to reorganize it? And I've had messages that include, I don't like any of it. You've got the wrong premise. You've got the, you're, you're making the wrong points. I say, well, tell me then what the, right, what the right points are. I don't hear voices, but I have strong feelings and indications. And then I start writing like crazy. That's happened many times. So try it. And the first dozen or so times you do it, maybe the first 20 times you do it, nothing will come. But keep asking him to talk to you. God likes to talk to his children. It will come. Or maybe you're too busy doing things you want to do, but not as important as prayer. And you're obviously, I mean, if you're spending hours on Facebook, for example, or even just an hour a day on Facebook, but somehow can't find time to pray, give me a break. Whatever we place ahead of God is our God. I preach to myself. I've been on Facebook myself the last month a lot with things about COVID and the election and different things and, and what's happening in the country. And I preach to myself right now. I'm off Facebook for a while, at least not as much time. I, I'll use it to, co to contact friends and family. Anything we put ahead of God is our God. It's idolatry. Go back to Matthew 22. This king, our father, puts on a great wedding for his son. He invites people to be honored guests at his wedding for his son. And all of them called first. Made excuses why they couldn't come, or really didn't want to come. They were getting married soon. They bought some cattle. They bought some horses or some land. Or they had a new business venture. Don't let that be your story when it comes to prayer. Remind yourself of the purpose, the necessity of prayer, that you want to be spared the great tribulation for one thing, but more than that, you want to grow in love with God so much that you look forward to times of praying to him. You enjoy it. If you're not enjoying it, the love that I speak of is not there yet. Some say I don't pray because I don't get my prayers answered anyway, so I get discouraged and I give up. Their very ill son or daughter died anyway after all their prayers. Their husband lost his job anyway. The pain that racks their body that they've been anointed for for healing got worse so why bother? 
so they don't find it easy to pray. This goes back to, again, not understanding prayer as a relationship or that God is trying to help us grow through the things that we suffer. Suffering is part of the Christian life. That's why I want you to hear the sermon I gave on thanking and praising God in all things and for all things. It's there. If you scroll back or just put in the, the title, thanking, just put the words thanking. It'll, it'll come up or thanksgiving or thanking. But anyway, in fact, we are to thank God for these times where he's developing and maturing us. Thank him for the trial, in the trial. You'll hear many examples in the sermon. It's when they began to praise God before they saw the answer. In fact, that's another sermon, praising God before you see the answer. Praise God before you see the answer. Thank God before you see the answer. Yeshua, thank God for the meal, and while there are only still five loaves and two fish. He still thank God. He thanked God that you have heard me while Lazarus lay in their dead. So we thank God before we see the answer, and we learn to trust God in the pain, in the death. Look, I know of, of, what, of what I speak. I've lost my sister a few years ago, I, I, and, and one of my adopted brothers, older than me, just disappeared. We don't know. We hear it's foul play. Just disappeared. No one knows. And I lost my child, my first son. I know pain of, of loss, of that, that kind of pain. I've had some cancers and different things in the past that God has healed, I didn't know he was going to heal it until he did. So, believe me, we have to trust him. Learn to trust him. And also, if you still don't understand grace of God deeply, you'll have more times of not being motivated to pray. If you understand grace and how God's unmerited favor is extended to you, you'll want to get back to him. You'll understand mercy triumphs over judgment. And another huge one is worth a whole sermon, really, is, and I, I'm, I'm really coming out of time. I, I should prob I'll probably leave these in the notes. But another big one, too, is, is understanding what it means to be in Christ. You won't be so hard and down on yourself. Yes, when I commit a sin, I'm very down on myself. But I'm, because I realize I am in Christ and that there is a fleshly component to my life and a spiritual component to my life, Go back and read Romans 7. Paul says that my flesh still causes me to sin, but it's a fleshly nature, my carnal nature in me that made me sin. At the end, he said, who's going to deliver me from this? In Romans 8, 1, he says, there's now no condemnation. I thank God for Jesus Christ. He says at the end of Romans 7, we've got to come to understand that. And now we're in Christ. We're part of his body. We're baptized into him. I might be a thumb. I don't mean just into a church group. I mean you personally are part of the actual body of Christ. No part of his body is unholy. So when God sees you, he should be seeing Yeshua. When people see you, they should be seeing Yeshua. For he must increase and, and we must decrease, like John the Baptist said. We still some, sometimes stumble, yes. And if we keep on living a life of adultery and lying and stealing and idolatry, of which we must repent and which I've repented of, of the things that apply to me, we just simply won't be in the kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, it says that, know you not, that on the list of a whole bunch of sinners, commandment breakers, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were cleansed, cleansed in the blood. So yes, we do have to let Christ be what is growing in us until he's fully formed. We died. We no longer live, Galatians 2.20. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The old me is not what I'm focusing on. The, the Christ living in me is what I want to focus on. And Colossians 3, verse 3. Colossians 3, verse 3. 
you died. Your life is hidden with Christ now in God. When Christ, who is our life, verse 4, Colossians 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So I no longer live. You should no longer live. You're a new creation in Christ. He doesn't see the old self. If he sees it, we are turning to him and we are turning away from sin as a way of life. We still stumble in gossip or sin or sex thoughts or coveting or anger thoughts. Whatever your sins are, you still stumble in them. But understand, you died Colossians 3.3, 3, your life, your life is hidden in Christ, in God. You're in God through Christ. Verse 4, when Christ, Colossians 3.4, when Christ who is our life, when Christ who is our life appears. Get that, accept that, treasure that, love him for that. Fall in love with him for that. When Christ our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So how does Jehovah Elohim, the set-apart holy God most high, see you now? Who is he seeing? He's not seeing the old you. He's seeing the new you, which is Christ. Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. Colossians 1.13, delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, conveyed past tense into the kingdom of the Son of His love. You see, when you're in Christ, it goes on to say that we're sitting on the right hand of God in another place. Ephesians 1, I think it is. We're in heavenly places in Christ. Okay, Ephesians 2, 6 says He's made us sit together. Ephesians 2, 6, He's made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. And Ephesians 1, verse 6, at the end of it, says that God has made us accepted, accepted, the way you are now? No. Accepted in the Beloved. That's how you are so perfect. That's how you're so mature. That's how you are so complete. In the Beloved. In fact, there's a verse that goes on to say that he, uh, that that he got Colossians one twenty eight, Colossians one twenty eight says that God is able to present every man perfect, mature, complete. That's what the verse means, God is able to present every man perfect. That's Colossians one twenty eight, in Christ Jesus. I have many sermons on what it means to be in Christ. Until you grasp that, you will continue to feel unworthy coming before God. I ask you, in fact, would Abba ever say of you, what's your name? Put your name in here. This is my beloved Don or Jan. This is my beloved Agnes or Linda or Suzanne, in whom I am well pleased. Would he ever say that? Like the voice in Matthew 3, 17, this is my beloved son in whom I will please. Yes, he should say that about you because your life is now in Christ. And he said that already about Christ. So yes, if we seek him, if we have faith in him, it's impossible to please him if we don't have faith. Hebrews 11 says that. So when you do have faith, you are pleasing God. And I think once you get these relationship issues addressed, write me, ask me some questions about it. Because I think these are the keys to really being able to pray to God, to see him the way he, you really should see him. God's not angry at you. You might be disappointed at times in what we do in the flesh. But he loves you and he sees Christ over you. I want to read you a verse I'll bet most of you haven't read. 
It's describing God our Father. I want to ask, I want to ask you, have you ever, I think I used this in a previous sermon, but have you ever thought of God this way, doing this for you? Put your name in there. For you, Jerry. For you, Michael. Whatever your name is. Zephaniah 3, 17. Yehovah your Elohim, the Lord your God, is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. Do you see that happening? God rejoicing over you with gladness? He will quiet you with His love. Just like a a toddler that's upset or a young child that's worried. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah three seventeen. Do you ever think of God as singing over you as he rejoices gladly over you? Anyway, time's... Time's up. I really need to stop. There's there's so much more I want to say. But just start doing it. Start praying more. Start the spontaneous prayers during the day, 5, 6, 10, 20, 30 times a day. I'm not kidding. Where you have a one or two minute prayer or a 30 second prayer. Just staying in touch with the the God you love. With Yeshua with whom you're in love. And yes, I talked to Yeshua. Stephen did. John did, Paul did, several of their scriptures, the end of the book of Revelation. Come, Lord, he's talking to Jesus, to Yeshua. So remember to pray that you may be counted worthy to escape. I'd like to be there and I'd like to see you there. Remember to seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. First, 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 root out whatever else is taking your focus away from time and prayer. Pray to establish a loving relationship. Learn to love God. Ask Him to show you how to love Him. As you do, prayer will be much easier, just like when you fell in love with the one you married. Pray so Yeshua knows that you and we won't hear those awful words ever. Depart from me. I never knew you. I want Him to know me. I want Him to know you. I want to know Him. I want Him to know me. Pray especially when you've been disobedient. Quickly reestablish the bond and the relationship and the forgiveness. Accept his gracious love. Unworthy as we are of it, as unworthy as the prodigal son was to have a fatted calf killed for him in celebration and music. Father still did it. That story is about you. Accept it. Make prayer your habit both the longer formal prayers and the many spontaneous ones. And will you commit with me right now, prayer is now going to become a daily, even many times a day, formal and spontaneous habit that you do often, often, often. I do have other sermons on prayer. Uh, One's called Hindered Prayer. I think you'll get a lot out of that. Another one's called Fervent Prayer. Just put those key words in the search bar. Uh, There's also blogs I've written uh, about prayer, just a two or three page blog. So please feel free to encourage me as well with positive comments in the in the comment section. You'll need to register for that or you can give me a star rating. I hope you'll encourage me if I get a one or two star. It might not encourage me, but if that's what you feel, then it will teach me that I need to, to get better at this. Anyway, I hope this has helped. And I hope you'll all be able to tell me soon that you're praying a lot, lot more, maybe even because of the sermon. You've made changes in your life, and you really can. So till next time, this is Philip Shields signing off. May Jehovah, our Father, be with you. <laughs>